I'd like to welcome you all back to our 10th annual Sacred Trust Talks and Book Signings event presented by the Gettysburg Foundation and Gettysburg National Military Park. The Gettysburg Foundation is the nonprofit partner to the National Park Service here at Gettysburg. And over the years, as we've presented the Sacred Trust Talks, we've had the great pleasure of hosting renowned Civil War authors, uh, speakers, uh, historians, National Park Service Rangers, and licensed battlefield guides so that they can share their unique perspectives on the Battle of Gettysburg and the Civil War with you. And this year is no exception. Uh, what, one thing that we have added this year that's very exciting is that we are live streaming each one of these talks to our website. So if tomorrow, uh, or, or if you have any friends and family who weren't able to make it today, uh, please, please let them know about this. It's at our website, www.gettysburgfoundation.org backslash sacred trust. Uh, there you can ask your questions to our authors in real time and have a really great experience online. So I'd like to introduce our first topic of the afternoon. Uh, Mark Leapson will share the history of the July 9th, 1864 desperate engagement the Battle of Monocacy and Confederate General Jubal Early's subsequent attack on Washington, D.C., known as the Battle That Saved Washington, D.C. Mark Leapson is a journalist, historian, and author of eight books, most recently, What So Proudly We Hail, Francis Scott Key, A Life, the first biography of the author of The Star-Spangled Banner in more than 75 years. A freelance writer, uh, since 1986, he's written for various newspapers and magazines and has been interviewed many times on radio and television, including the Today Show, CNN, and the Discovery Channel. Invited to speak at co uh, to college students throughout the U.S., he's chaired panels at numerous academic conferences, and I would like for you all to join me in welcoming Mr. Mark Leibson. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. I want to thank the Gettysburg folks for thinking of me on, on this event. I mean, I, Ed Ayers was here earlier, and Bud Robertson is coming after me. I mean, what did they, what were they thinking when they got me in between them? I, I'm just, I'm flabbergasted. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit about this book that I wrote called Desperate Engagement, and it's a history of the Civil War Battle of Monocacy, Ju July 9th, 1864. Um, and they're celebrating their 150th, you know, right now. Um, if you haven't been to Monocacy, I would strongly recommend that you go there. Uh, it's not very far from here. It's sort of an underappreciated battle, and um, I hope that um, once you hear a little bit about it, you might be more interested. Oh, and also I'll be signing books afterwards. So, um, so the other thing is, what, the reason I said that about myself and Ed Ayers and Bud Robertson and all the other great historians is that, you know, I'm, I've written eight books. Uh, I teach U.S. history at a community college in Virginia, um, but I'm not a Civil War expert. I, of course, teach it, and I know a, a decent amount about it, but I, I know people in my audience, every time I talk about the Civil War, know more about the war than I do. However, I do consider myself pretty knowledgeable about one particular aspect of the war. And so when it comes time for questions, I would like for you to please limit your questions to the part of the Civil War that I know a lot about. <laughs> and I'm going to define that one for you right now. So feel free to ask me anything about the Civil War that happened between June 13th, 1864 and July 13th, 1864. And by the way, just make it in the Eastern Theater and, and north of Richmond, and we'll, we'll be good, okay? So um, June 13th, 1864, just to put it in a little bit of perspective, you know, this is the, uh, uh, the end of probably the bloodiest six weeks of the Civil War. The th last three big battles in May and June of 64, Wilderness, Spotsylvania Courthouse, and Cold Harbor. You all know where all those are, right? We're talking about Orange County, Virginia, then moving west to near Fredericksburg, and then around Richmond. This was Grant's wilderness campaign. This was Grant's grand plan to end the Civil War. And at great cost, I mean, Grant probably lost, oh gosh, 35 to 40,000 killed and wounded at those three horrible big battles. And Lee 
it might have been 45 or 50, and Lee about 25 or 30,000. But at the end of the wilderness campaign, Grant had in place what he wanted. He had Lee surrounded outside of Richmond and Petersburg, and he believed that with superior numbers, with superior everything in the North, that he could choke Lee out and end the war. So um, Robert E. Lee himself realized what uh, Grant was doing, and um, he devised a bold four-part plan to sort of counteract what he was going to do. And what were the four parts of Lee's plan? I have them written down here just so I don't forget. One was he wanted to free the Shenandoah Valley of Union troops. Remember, the Union had the valley. Remember, the valley was the breadbasket of, of Richmond. That's where the food came from. So he wanted to get the Yankees out of the valley, um, and he wanted to um, free the railroads up so they could get food from, from the valley. Um, he also, uh, the orders were that, that he gave out was he wanted to quote unquote threaten Washington, D.C. Third, he wanted to, uh, if possible, do a raid on the, conf on the Union prison at Fort Lookout, Point Lookout, Maryland. Everybody know where Point Lookout is? Southern Maryland, you know that? The very tip of Southern Maryland is Point Lookout. There were about 15,000 Confederate prisoners held at Point Lookout. The, you know, representing about a corps of troops if they were freed. So that was part of the mission, if possible. But the main thing that Lee wanted of this bold four-part plan was to force Grant to take troops away from Richmond and Petersburg because Grant, Lee knew that he could not hold out forever against Grant. So in the early morning hours of June 13, 1864, Lee sent an entire uh, corps of troops, about 11,000 troops, away from the defenses of Richmond and Petersburg. They did it in the early morning hours. They snuck out of there. And who did Lee have uh, in charge of that? Well, luckily for a, a historian, he had a really colorful character, one of the most colorful characters of the Civil War, Jubal Anderson Early. You all know about Jubal Early? Want me to tell you a little bit about him? I'm going to anyway, so. <laughs> I mean, Early was quite a character. Uh, he was from Montgomery County, a, a little town called Rocky Mount, Virginia, in south central Virginia. He was from a prominent family. Um, they sent him to West Point, not to become an army officer, though, but because back then, as is true now, West Point provided a very good education. He was a so-so student. He did have to serve in the military. He went down to Florida and served in the Seminole Wars, but nothing much was happening. He came back to Rocky Mount. He read the law. He became a big lawyer in town. Uh, he was district attorney at one point. He was elected to the Virginia House of Delegates and served for one term. He was um, then called back in, uh, to service during the Mexican War, but by the time he got out to Mexico, fighting had stopped. So he had no military experience when the Civil War started. He was a member of the Virginia Secession Convention, who actually voted against secession. Remember, Virginia was the last Confederate, soon to be Confederate state, to secede from the Union. And, but when the tide turned, you know, they had a series of votes. When the tide turned, Early uh, voted for a secession, and then became probably one of the most, I don't, I, don't think you, I don't think you can name another more gung-ho Confederate for the rest of his life. I mean, Early was dedicated to the cause. Now, and he was also um, a huge guy. He, he, had, he wore the slouch hat. He had a big scraggly beard. I showed you his picture, the hair. He was kind of a grumpy guy. Um, he had some bad experiences with women. He was a woman hater. He was viciously racist. He was he was noted for his cursing, his drinking, and his tobacco chewing. He didn't get along with very many people, including most of the generals. The men had a love-hate relationship with him. Oh, those were his good points, by the way. Uh, <laughs> he didn't judge terrain very well. Uh, he was very aggressive, though. He might have been the South's most aggressive commander. And Lee basically, so why did Lee choose this guy? with a? because he was so aggressive, and because he didn't have very many generals left at this point. Because of all that grumpiness and drinking, and he also had this high-pitched voice, everybody said, so he you know, kind of cursed a lot like that. And uh, uh, Lee called him my bad old man. 
even though Lee was older than Early, but Early had contracted arthritis really badly when he went out to Mexico, and he was kind of slouched over all the time, and he looked, you know, scraggly and so on. And, you know, you couldn't really um, find two characters who were opposites than Lee and Early. You know, Lee was a gentle man and a gentleman, and Jubal Early was maybe the opposite of both of those. One quick early uh, anecdote. They were on the trail one time, and they stopped at a friendly house. And when they, after eating and drinking, the woman of the house gave him a canteen and said, you know, General Early, here's something very special for you to drink. So they weren't like 50 feet down the road. Early takes a giant swig, and he spits it out, and he says, that's goddamn buttermilk. He was expecting something a little more special than that. So Lee chooses early to go on this bold mission. And so the men, uh, you know, about a third of his troops he sends away from Richmond and Petersburg. They, they march 70 miles due west to Charlottesville, Virginia. They get on rickety old trains, and they arrive at Lynchburg, Virginia, on June 18, 1864. Now, what ensues is the Battle of Lynchburg. I don't believe anybody's going to get up on the stage and talk about the Battle of Lynchburg because nothing much happened because the Union general in charge fled when he heard, when he realized he was up against Early and a corps of troops. Who was that? That was Dave Hunter, you know, not the sharpest knife in the Union general drawer. Uh, Hunter, AKA Dak Black Dave, uh, skedaddled south and he went over the Blue Ridge into what is now West Virginia and took himself out of the war for a month. A month. Guess what? Lee's objective number one, kick the Yankees out of the valley. Done. Now Early thought, you know, he was aggressive. He thought about going after Hunter, but he reconsidered and the men marched north. So that is called going down the valley, right, Shenandoah Valley, because the river flows backwards. So they went down the valley. They went through Lexington, where they paid homage to Stonewall Jackson at his grave. They arrived at um, the Union. The Union had a big uh, storehouse at Martinsburg. You know, now it's West Virginia, but it was Virginia back then. And uh, the general there, as soon as he saw Early, oh, by the way, Early picked up 2,000 more cavalry. So now he's got about 13,000 troops. The general there also fled, and that was another unsharp knife in the Union drawer, and that was Franz Siegel. He was German. He was a political general. Lincoln appointed Siegel uh, because he wanted to recruit Germans to the Union cause and German Americans. And he, he, was, he, was the, he was the general who was in charge at the Battle of Newmarket in May. Remember that one? The Union troops had the advantage, and then they lost because the entire Corps of Cadets from VMI marched, whatever it was, 70 miles through the mud and turned the tide. Fit boys as young as 15 years old. So Franz Siegel, nicknamed the Flying Dutchman for his tendency to flee the battlefield, <laughs> he fled again. And so early in his troops, it's 4th of July, so they had a nice, party raiding the Union's supply of food and adult beverages. The next day, July 5th, so I guess that was exactly 150 years ago today, the early and his, whatever it was, 13,000, almost 14,000 troops crossed the river at Shepherdstown, West Virginia. Now this was the third movement north into this part of the world by the Union, the one you never, by, by, the, by, the, by Lee's army, the one you never hear about. Everybody knows about Antietam in 62, everybody knows about Gettysburg in 63, but you, you sort of never hear about this, you know, I, I'm choosing my words carefully because I've been criticized for calling this an invasion. People, technically, an invasion is when you go to take territory, so people say it wasn't an invasion, it was a raid, I don't know, a raid, 13,000 troops. You know, in fact, when my agent and editor and I were talking about the title for this book, uh, by the way, I come up with titles no one ever chooses. It's, my title was going to be The Third Invasion. They said it sounded like a science fiction book, so we went with Desperate Engagement, which is a quote from uh, a memoir who, uh, of a guy who was in the battle who described it. So The Third Invasion takes place on July 5th, 1864, entire corps of troops crosses the Potomac River. 
at Harper's, uh, and, and, and arrives at Harper's Ferry. Now, Franz Siegel, by the way, Union intelligence, I think you all know this, was not really that great during the Civil War. And it had failed on this occasion, too, because the Union High Command did not know that entire Corps of Troops had left the defenses of Richmond, remember that was June 13th, until they crossed the Potomac on July 5th. And then the reports were so bad, they, were, they, had the, they, had, they had it as under General Ewell. It wasn't Ewell, it was another general whose name started with an E, early. And then the numbers kept getting conflated. 20,000, 25, one report said there were 45,000 troops crossing the Potomac. We're only 50 miles from Washington, D.C. They're at Harper's Ferry. Again, Siegel had gone, everybody been to Harper's Ferry? The Maryland Heights, you know where that is? Up on the other side of the Potomac. That's where Siegel was. And again, Early thought about going after him, but Siegel had the, had the, you know, the tactical advantage. So Early didn't. So he made a little bit of a right turn, and he went to what, around Antietam. Um, and they rested for a couple of days. Um, and this was where Lee sent the order to do the prisoner, uh, the Point Lookout prisoner raid. And it was so secret that he didn't want to put it over the wire. So he wrote it out by hand, and he gave it to his son, Rob Lee. And Rob Lee got on his horse and rode up from Richmond to Antietam to hand deliver the order to Early. Um, and so word is starting to seep in that a, maybe as many as 40,000 Confederate troops are 50 miles west of Washington. And people are starting to get a little antsy. Now, let's just talk about Washington, D.C. and the Civil War. Think about it. Washington is just across the river from Virginia. I mean, it's only 90 miles from Richmond. There was very much concern about a Confederate invasion of the nation's capital from the time the war started. And the concern really picked up after First Manassas in August of 1861, a, a, a you know, a defeat 35 miles from the city. So what happened was they decided to build a series of forts and fortifications to ring the city. They started it right there in the summer of 61. And by the time we're talking about in the summer of 64, it was completed. Washington was surrounded by 67 forts. And they were connected by a series of berms and embankments. Now, they weren't huge forts. They were defensive forts. Some of them weren't much bigger than this tent, or maybe twice as big, and they all faced to the outside, right? They were just three-sided. They bristled with artillery, by the way, including the biggest forts. Um, and these 67 forts, they're all gone now, except for one, and that is Fort Ward in Alexandria. Remember, the, the, this ring of forts, kind of like a beltway, um, extended into Virginia because the Union took Northern Virginia right in May of 61. Did you have a question? A woman lives five minutes from Fort Ward. And it's the only one that stands as it was. Fort Stevens, which we'll talk about in a minute, has been partially rebuilt and is a National Park Service site. So um, these defenses of Washington were designed to be manned by something like, I don't know, 45,000, 50,000 troops. But now we're in the summer of 64. And, you know, virtually all the able-bodied troops are down serving down in Richmond and Petersburg um, with, with, um, with Grant. So um, we don't know the exact number, but we think that there are only about 10,000 troops on those barricades designed for 50 or 60,000. And who were those troops? Okay. They were members, almost all of them were members of the Veteran Reserve Corps, okay? Now, the Veteran Reserve Corps was, had just changed its name. Does anybody know what the name was before that? The Invalid Corps, right. These were people, who, guys who had been wounded, had recovered, and were, but want not enough to fight, so they gave them rear echelon type duties. They gave them a pale blue uniform and called them, they were so embarrassed to be called invalids that they changed the name to the Veteran Reserve Corps. So that's who's defending Washington, D.C. 10,000 invalids, right? When with Jubal Early and, a, you know, a core of troops, but 50 miles away. Um, and so we'll go back to Early now. 
and Early is in Antietam, he gets the order, and so then they start, they go to, through Middletown, Maryland, and then they get up to um, the area of the Monocacy Junction, which is four miles south of Frederick. Has that anybody been to Monocacy? Oh, good, I'll see you later then. <laughs> yeah, so you know where it is. Um, it's uh, Frederick and Monocacy are a very strategic point where two railroad lines cross, where two big roads cross, the Baltimore Pike and the Georgetown Pike, as they were known back then. There was a lot of stuff that happened in Frederick um, during the Civil War. Um, now, I told you that Union uh, intelligence was not that great during the war. Um, they're thinking, now, oh, the, let me just go back a bit. So, you know, when Grant finally found out that Lee had detached all these troops, he, he knew what Lee was up to, and he knew that it was a ploy or a, a strategic move to get him to take troops away from Richmond and Petersburg. So he didn't want to do it. He, and you know, you can read the telegrams going back and forth. I mean, Halleck and, and Lincoln, you know, Lincoln was the commander in chief who really kept a good close watch on him, what things were happening, but he didn't micromanage. He never ordered Grant to do anything. You know, never ordered his generals to do anything right, especially Grant, who basically, you know, saved the Union when he took over and, and all this stuff. So um, Grant is not doing anything. Lincoln is not doing anything. Halleck is not doing anything. But one Union general did take action, and that is the other main player in the book, and that is another colorful character of the Civil War, and that's Lew Wallace, right? Union General Lew Wallace, who had probably one of the best goatees of any Union General. I want a goatee like that. Um, so who was Lew Wallace, and what was he doing, and so on? He was from a small town in Indiana called Crawfordsville. And um, in fact, there's a Lew Wallace Museum in Crawfordsville, Indiana. And um, Wallace was born into a prominent family in Indiana, his um, father or uncle was a governor of the state. He was a young man, and he didn't really know what he wanted to do with his life. He was a journalist. He didn't like that. He was kind of floundering before the Civil War, although he did get into the Zouave movement, right? You all know what the Zouaves are, Zouaves. I've got a little picture here. Uh, he had a Zouave regiment. So those were the guys that, that did close order drill. People would come out like it was an NFL game back then. Seriously, 10,000 people would come to watch these Zoabs in their crazy uniforms uh, do cl close order drill. Zoabs fought at this battle at Gettysburg and many others. They were even Zoabs units in the, in the Confederate Army. So Wallace had a, had a unit, but it was mostly for drilling. It was for drilling, totally. When the war started, he started his own regiment. I think it was the 11th Indiana. And um, he was the colonel of the regiment, and he had big success in the early part of the war. He it, it, it acquitted himself very well at the battles of, uh, I was going to say Fort McHenry, sorry. I just wrote this biography of Francis Scott Key and like, Fort McHenry, Forts Henry and Donaldson <laughs> in Tennessee. And then came Shiloh. And unhappily for Lew Wallace, he got his regiment lost the first night. You know, probably not his fault. I mean, it was at night, it was down there. God knows how these people found their way around anywhere. But, you know, Grant was in charge at Shiloh, and Halleck was Halleck's last command in the field. And so um, they were not very happy with Lew Wallace, although he did, they did fight on the second day. But they basically forced Wallace out of the war. And he went back to Crawfordsville, but he got back in, and they gave him a pretty crappy job, actually. He was the commanding general of the Middle Atlantic Department. Basically, he was the military governor of the city of Baltimore. You know, not a plum job. There was, there was secessionist sentiment in Baltimore, for sure, but most of the time, he didn't have anything to do. He was itching to get back in the war. So um, Wallace, seeing the same cables, as Halleck, who didn't take action, as Lincoln, who didn't take action, as Grant, who didn't want to take action. He had something else going on. He had John Garrett. Who was John Garrett? He was the president of the B&O Railroad. And John Garrett had a better 
intelligence operation going than the Union did. Why? Because he had station masters all along the railroad. And the station masters were tapping back on the telegraph to headquarters in Baltimore saying, you know what? We've got Jubal Early and 15,000 troops heading your way. And, and he could keep track of where they were going. So Garrett, probably for reasons having less to do with being either a union or pro-union or pro-Confederate, more being pro his own business, you know, he wanted to keep the railroads open, he lobbied Wallace. And that's all Wallace needed. So on his own, without any orders from Washington, and this was a pretty gutsy move on Wallace's part because he was already in hot water with the high command. Halleck hated him. What was his nickname? Old Brains Halleck. He, uh, he hated him from you know, what had happened earlier. And Grant, he was not a favorite with Grant. So on his own, he gathered up as many troops as he could, which was only about 2,800. And guess who these 2,800 were? They were 100 Days men. You all know who 100 Days men were, right? I know these guys do. They were, they were these were mostly from uh, Ohio and Indiana and Illinois. And they had just joined for 100 days. They hadn't seen a shot fired in anger. So what does Lou Wallace do? He takes 2,800 100 Days men to face Jubal Early and 14,000 Confederate troops, which According to the, tele, you know, to the Union intelligence, it could have been 30 or 40,000. Pretty gutsy, or you could say crazy move on Wallace's part. So they get on trains in Baltimore, and they come down to the Monocacy Junction, which is four miles south of Frederick, and they array, them, array themselves on both sides of the Monocacy River. Wallace takes the high ground, a good strategic position for his headquarters. Meanwhile, finally, in Richmond, Grant gives in and he decides he's going to send the Sixth Corps up to meet uh, Wallace. And so uh, they wake the, the guys up early in the morning. They march up to the James River to a place called City Point, City Point. Um, and they get on steamships. They go down the James. They come up the Chesapeake River. And they arrive in Baltimore at the Camden Yards station, right, where the baseball stadium is. They get on trains, and um, they reach, and these are battle-hardened troops who have been through wilderness campaign, wilderness Spotsylvania Courthouse and Cold Harbor, and much more. So, he ne uh, and they arrive at the Monocacy Junction at about 8 o'clock in the morning on July 9th, 1864, at which point soon thereafter the battle begins. Wallace knows what to do with those troops. He arrays them up and down the Monocacy River. And the battle starts at 8 a.m. and it lasts until 4.30 p.m. Early has 14,000 troops. Wallace has about 6,800. Of course, Early is going to prevail. Now, the other thing you should remember is that Early did not want to fight a big battle at Monocacy. Remember, one of his four goals was to threaten Washington, D.C. He was only, what, 40 miles from his goal. He didn't want to expend the troops. And by the way, it was one hot day, July 9th, 1864. Everybody who wrote about that battle in letters and in memoirs after comments about how hot it was. Nobody says a temperature, but you know what it can be like around. I mean, today's a beautiful day and it's a little warm. It was probably 20 degrees hotter. It's probably in the low 90s and really humid. Um, and don't forget, the Confederate troops had been on the march since June 13th. It's now July 9th. Plus, they wore those wool uniforms. I, I don't know how these guys did it. So um, the battle start, uh, uh, as far as artillery, Wallace has three guns. Early has three artillery batteries. But Early does not want to engage in a full fight here. And so, in fact, he wasn't even on the field of battle when it started. He was in Frederick extorting $100,000 from the city fathers cough up or we're going to burn your city. <laughs> the document that they, the bankers turned over to him is on display in Frederick today. Um, however, even though Early didn't want to, what happened over the course of that battle turned out to be there was a full field battle. I mean, you all have been on the battlefield. It was a kind of lots of different things. It's a hard battle to envision. You have to really get in your car and, you know, for a battle that just not like three days here, but it took place from 8.30 to 4 o'clock. Um, 
you have to get in your car to go to three different places really to see where most of the fighting went. You know, John Brown Gordon, who was one of um, Early's, uh, you know, commanded a division, um, called it the sharpest fight he was in. John Brown Gordon shot five times at Antietam, once through the cheek. You know, if you ever see a picture of Gordon, he's always facing to this side because his cheek got blown out at Antietam, got shot off his, his horse. Sharpest fight. You know, they, the, the river ran red with blood. I know they say that about other battles, but nevertheless, you know, you can get a picture of it. So when er, and er, at, the, at the, um, the Thomas farm, that's where the, most of the fighting, it was a very hot day. The Union troops, and these Sixth Corps guys were rough, were rough fighters, and they were ready for the Confederates. They were corn and wheat fields. They were hiding behind the, the what do you call those, shafts, sh you know, when they shuck the wheat and whatever they were. And um, uh, it, it was brutal. Uh, and you can read a lot of accounts of it from the letters and from, from the memoirs. The Confederates did prevail, um, and the Union suffered about 1,300 casualties, killed, wounded, prisoner, and missing. Confederates, about 800. So we have 2,100 casualties here. And yeah, okay, it wasn't Antietam, 22,000. It wasn't Gettysburg. But, you know, people call it a skirmish. I'm sorry, that was not a skirmish. This was a battle. And um, Wallace, you know, fled up to, uh, back to Baltimore, stopping at Ellicott City, Maryland. Uh, early, uncharacteristically for him, let his troops rest for a day after the battle. He was later criticized for that. But think about it, as I said earlier, it was a brutally, brutally hot day. It was a tough fight, and these guys had been on the march since, you know, June 13th. Um, the next day, uh, July 10th, early, moved towards Washington, D.C. Now there's panic in the streets in Washington. Wallace defeated at Monocacy, early Confederates heading to D.C. You know, the word motley has been used to describe who was defending Washington at this time. The word goes out, civilians come to the barricades. So you have clerks from the State Department. I mean, uh, I was at the government printing office. They had their own little, like, defense force. All those guys went out to the, to the barricades. It was. It was, I was going to say desperate, but maybe it was desperate. There was panic in the streets. Now, you know, President Lincoln was not as worried as other people were. However, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy provisioned a ship in the Potomac to get Lincoln out of town should the Confederates take over Washington. I mean, it was getting a little dicey. So Early is now moving to, he sent, by the way, he sent 2,000 of his cavalry north to Baltimore, two reasons. One, as a feint, so that the Union would not know his main objective, which was to attack Washington. And two, to cut the railroad line and the telegraph line, which they did. So now, to add to the panic in the streets, Washington is incommunicado. They, don't, they, they have no communication to know what's going on. Um, there was some skirmishing. Uh, in the towns of Rockville and Gaithersburg, Maryland. You all know where that is, along Route 355. They're now the suburbs of Washington, but back then they were consi considered pretty far out. And then on July 11th, 1864, 150 years ago, um, Jubal Early, who was one of those commanders who was out in front of his troops, reached the outskirts of Washington, D.C. I mean, think of Washington, D.C. as shaped like a diamond, right? At the very tip of the diamond, was Fort Stevens, one of the most fortified of the forts, if not the most fortified, right across the Maryland line from Silver Spring, Maryland. Early was outside Fort Stevens in the, on the morning of July 11th, and through his glass on his horse, he could see the Capitol Dome. The South's most aggressive, arguably most aggressive commander had the Capitol Dome within his sights. And he had the choice, according to his orders from Robert E. Lee, whether to attack or not. Early did not attack. And he defended that decision for the rest of his life and his career. And when asked later why he didn't do it, he said several things. One was, you know, I said it twice already. They've been marching since June 13th. The men, he, only, he was down to about 9,000 men after the casualties at Monocacy and after uh, he had to leave bunches of them back to take care of the Union prisoners. Um, and he also 
saw Fort Stevens, which was bristling with guns. You could see it on the cover of, of the book. We have pictures of it. Um, and he saw men on the parapets. Now, when Early, real, Early realized he was up against it at Monocacy with the six core men because they had a distinctive uh, white cross as their, as their in insignia. He couldn't see any white crosses, but he thought the Sixth Corps was at the defenses of Washington. So he decided that he could not make a full attack because his men were strung out all along the Georgetown Pike. They were tired, and he thought he was facing a pretty tough foe at this point. So, um, however, Early was aggressive. So when the men did get up, there was skirmishing. There was artillery going back and forth. They did have the some of their artillery with them. And um, the people from Washington heard the noise and came out to see what it was about. Now, when we say Washington, Fort Stevens was you know, technically inside Washington, D.C., but back then it was farmland out there. I mean, wh what they considered Washington was downtown, Georgetown, even Alexandria, which is part of Washington. And so people came out, including President Lincoln. And President Lincoln stood on the parapet at Fort Stevens, all six feet, four of them with his hat, right? And don't you know that a Confederate sharpshooter shooting from the trees, God knows how many hundreds of yards away, in what was, I, I when I started this book, I used to say, what is now Walter Reed, but Walter Reed has moved. <laughs> but the old Walter Reed Army Medical Center, there's a plaque there saying this. Anyway, this Confederate sharpshooter wounded a Union surgeon standing next to President Lincoln, at which point Lincoln was kindly asked to remove himself from the barricade. So um, the fighting went on back and forth at outside of Fort Stevens on July 11th. Um, and that night, Early took his commanders back into Silver Spring to spend the night and have a council of war and figure out what to do next. Who were his commanders? John Brown Gordon of Georgia, Rhodes and Ramsour from Virginia, and John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky. John C. Breckinridge, former vice president of the United States under James Buchanan, had, oh, and, and they went to the house uh, owned by the Blair family. You all have maybe heard of the Blair family. So Preston Blair, the patriarch, was what? Yeah, he was um, a very close friend of Lincoln's. He was a founder of the Republican Party. Blair House, you heard of Blair House? Across from the White House where official guests lived, that was owned by Blair. Um, they had these mansions in Silver Spring. His son was Montgomery Blair, who was Postmaster General of the United States. Well, the Blairs decided this was a good time to go fishing. So <laughs> they, w they went to Pennsylvania, they went fishing, and uh, uh, early took over the house, the generals, and by the way, Breckinridge, who had been there before when he was vice president, knew where the wine cellar was. So early and the generals had a nice dinner, drank up all the Blair's wine, and maybe booze, not maybe, and drank up their booze, and decided, they basically decided the next day, July 12th, they would decide whether or not to ma mount a full bore attack on Washington, D.C. So, in the interim, Grant, when he finally hears what's go when he hears what's finally going on there, decides he has to send the rest of the Sixth Corps up. Plus, I think it was the Ninth Corps, the Eleventh Corps, another corps that was on the way up from New Orleans to Richmond. They didn't even stop. The trains went up to Washington again. The the Sixth Corps guys outside of Richmond, they um, woke him up early in the morning. They went up to City Point. They got on steamers, they went down the James, this time they went up the Potomac. And you know, I read a great letter from one of the Confederate officers as they were passing Mount Vernon, right? They went right by Mount Vernon. He goes, what in the hell is going on here? Americans going to fight other Americans right by the house of our George Washington. So, um, and they arrive at the old Sixth Street docks. Um, did you give me that 10 sign yet? Thank you, okay, oh geez. I have about 20 more minutes and I have 10 to go, so I'm just gonna have another sip of Starbucks here. All right, so they get to uh, the old dock and they march. By the way, they get there at about noontime, at about the time early 
had gotten to Port Stevens. So then they, they actually took a wrong turn. By the way, the, the, the people of Washington greeted them like heroes. They gave them, they had ice water and sandwiches, and then they marched the wrong way. They went, to, <laughs> they went towards Georgia. Oh, no, not that way. Go up that way. So they got to Fort Stevens, and um, when Early came, the point being, when Early comes back the next day, he sees six core guys with the white stripes, so with the white cross. So he doesn't attack. But again, there's a second day of fighting, artillery skirmishes. And, uh, and then um, nightfall comes on the 12th. The next morning, July 13th, 1864, the Union guys wake up and look out. Early's gone. He retraced his steps, went back through Silver Spring, went down to a town called Poolsville in Montgomery County, Maryland, and crossed the Potomac River at White's Ford. Is anybody, there's a ferry boat there. Has anybody been on that ferry boat? at White's Ford. What's the name of the ferry boat? Jubal. The Jubal Early. Now you know why, because that's when Early crossed back over the Potomac on July 13th, 1864. By the way, remember what I said when I started? My knowledge of the Civil War ends at July 13th, 1864. So I'll end, except for a couple of things. <laughs> casualties. Um, you know, there were 300 Union casualties killed and wounded in the fighting at Fort Stevens. It was the only fighting in Washington, D.C. during the war. Who knows about this? Um, we don't have a, conf a figure for the Confederate. Uh, never made the OR. But um, it had to be that many or more. And, you know, there's a very small national cemetery on Georgia Avenue in Washington, D.C., near Fort Stevens, where something like 44 Union soldiers are buried. No one goes there. Compu computers. Commuters drive by thousands every day, and they never see it. I'd, if you in the neighborhood, take a look. It's, it's a very moving thing. So um, I'll just finish by saying, talking about the subtitle of the book, How a Little-Known Civil War Battle um, Saved Washington, D.C. and Changed American History. Did the Battle of Monocacy save Washington, D.C.? If you go to Monocacy, what do they say? It's a battle that saved Washington, D.C. And, you know, Lew Wallace was relieved of his command a after he was defeated at Monocacy. But you know what? He was given his command back within a week or two. Uh, Grant wrote in his memoirs that if Wallace had not held early up for a day and count a second day when he rested his troops, that he, Grant, would not have had time to get the troops up from Richmond and Petersburg to help defend Washington, D.C. So I think we can say it did save Washington, D.C. What did it save Washington, D.C. from? Now we don't know. We're in the what ifs of history, right? Historians hate what ifs, but consider a few things. By the way, this is an election year, right? 64, Lincoln's popularity is in the toilet. Nobody thinks he's even going to get the Republican nomination, much less, you know, win the election. Um, he, you know, he did get the nomination. He had to choose a Democrat, a Southern Democrat, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, to be his running mate, and he barely won the election. So what if, you know, here's a what if, didn't happen. What if Jubal Early and 11,000 mean and hungry Confederate troops are breached Fort Stevens and are on the streets of Washington, D.C. Lincoln flees on the ship. Remember, they had a ship waiting for him. I mean, they didn't have CNN back then, did they? They had Twitter. No, they didn't have that. But, you know, th that war was covered very heavily in the newspapers and the news weeklies. Had the word gotten out wh early in Washington, Lincoln flees. You know, it's a what if. It never happened. But do you think Lincoln could have got elected president? Who knows? It's just something to consider. And, uh, you know, I mean, Early could have raided the Treasury. He could have burned the White House like the British did in 1814, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and did it change U.S. history? You know, another what if, but I want you to consider this. Remember that, um, that um, Grant, uh, Lincoln, Lee's main goal was to force Grant to take troops away from Richmond and Petersburg. I'm talking about the whole campaign here. Here are the figures. On June 30th, there were 137,454 Union troops surrounding Richmond and Petersburg. June 30th. August 31st, 69,206. Almost half. Okay, some of them had their enlistments come up and they went home, but a lot of them left for this. So, you know, here's the what if. What if this didn't happen? What if 137,000 troops had stayed there? It just stands to reason that, uh, that, that, that Grant would have forced his plan to come true. And it did come true. We know that, right? In March of 65, he forced Lee out. Appomattox, war is over. So my contention is that it, it could have changed history. It's a what if, but that war, who knows when it could have been over.
three months earlier, six months, we'll never know, but it's an intriguing what if. And the other thing is, the last thing I'll say to you, it, well, I got two more things. The last is that, you know, history can turn on little things. The outcome of the war turns on Jubal Early spending an extra day at Monocacy. Who knows? It's just one of those things to ponder. And, you know, looking at it later, um, I'll end with what somebody once said about this whole thing about why Washington, D.C. was saved because Jubal Early was one day late. Thank you very much. We do have, we, oh, oh. We, <laughs> we do have time for some questions I'd be happy to answer. I mean, I skipped over an awful lot, even though I was talking a mile a minute. Um, I just really hit the tip of the iceberg, so it's in the book, everybody. So, anybody? How long did the Sixth Corps stay at Fort Stevens after the 13th? Now you're asking me a question after July 13th, 1864. <laughs> My educated guess is not very long because they needed, they needed down south. I mean, the threat was over, so. Yes, sir. This is going to be recorded on the internet for posterity, so you want your voice on there. Why didn't Grant attack Lee and maybe end the Civil War? I, I think, you know what, I think it was the Wilderness Campaign. Even Grant, who was the most, you know, as aggressive as you could possibly get, unconditional surrender Grant, they had to, they had to stop after, after Cold Harbor. He was just too bloody. I mean, he had lost too many men. I think he was just gathering until he could make the move. But don't forget, they didn't know that the entire Corps of Troops left until July 5th, not June 13th when they left. Anybody else? Are we good? Thank you, everybody.